So far, we were talking about unconstrained optimization, uh, where we said that, look, we are computing the gradient. How can we use the gradient to come to a point which satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality? Uh, in the assignments, you are uh, studying some of those concepts. You are revisiting those concepts again. Uh, in assignment number two, you are also asked to write a code for solving some optimization problems. So you will get a hands-on experience with working on these uh, algorithms. Like how do you, so in the class we have done the theory, or not even the theory, we have just learned the algorithm. In your assignments, you are trying to code those algorithms. So today we are going to start a new topic, which is optimization over convex sets. Uh, so let's... Let's try to understand what we are trying to do. I want to minimize f of x. x is in some convex set capital X. f is a function from x to r. So f is a function that, so this, this convex set has to be closed. Uh, and I have a function f that maps this closed convex set to a real number. And we want to try to solve this particular problem. Now what are the typical convex sets? So we've discussed about it during the uh, during the third lecture when we were talking about convex functions and convex sets. So typical convex sets are and this is known as a box. This is a positive quadrant. This is a subspace. This is just a convex set. I mean, there's no specific name to this particular set. So these are the typical convex sets that you would want to optimize the functions over. Oh, there is also sphere. Let me write it here. X minus uh, this is a sphere. And this could be any norm, P. <laughs> and I think uh, you can take intersections of any of these sets as well. Because intersection of convex sets is convex, so any of these intersections is fine. You will get a convex set. 
Okay, so so now we have a function f that is defined either they are defined over the entire Euclidean space R n or sometimes they are defined only on the convex set, and we want to minimize this function over the convex set. So I wanted to show you what each of these convex sets looks like. So this is my R n. And the first box constraint is going to look something like this. So this is the box. Uh, that's this set. Uh, X greater than 0. Uh, basically, that's this set. This is your x greater than 0, including the axis. So the axis is also included in the set. Uh, then the third one is basically a hyperplane, something like this, where origin origin is actually on the plane itself. So ax, so if, if you put x equals to 0, ax is equal to 0. So that particular subspace actually contains the origin. And then the fourth set. This is my ax equals to 0. The fourth set is going to look something like this. So this is my fourth set. It might look something like this. Sometimes it could extend all the way to infinity as well. It depends on how the set is uh, constructed. And then the fifth one is uh, just a sphere. So the sphere might look something like, uh, because I'm using the p-norm, the sphere might also look something like this. So this is my. Okay, so these are the sets that uh, we are trying to optimize the function over. Any question? So whenever we want to study optimization, the first thing we want to do is define what exactly it means to solve this problem. So what's a, what's a minimum point? What's a local minimum? What's a global minimum for this particular class of problems? And then we want to find the necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality before we dive into what exactly is the algorithm that will allow us to solve this problem. Okay? So that's the agenda for this particular class. We'll talk about what is a global and a local minimum in this particular situation? And what's the necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality? OK? Awesome. So x star is a. local minimum of f if and only if there exists epsilon greater than 0 such that f of x is less than e f of x star is less than equal to f of x for all x in capital x such that norm of x minus x star is less than epsilon. So let's try to uh, visualize this. 
I have a convex set and this is my x star so what does this say for all x in the convex set such that x minus x star is less than epsilon so I need to draw a ball of radius epsilon and my function value in this particular ball the function value at every point within that ball has to be greater than the function at x star so remember this center point is my x star so the value of the function at any point within this ball but this ball remember that this ball is not the entire ball in rn this ball only contains the point that are in the convex set capital x so i'm just looking at the surface i'm drawing a ball on this surface and within like the function value at any of these points is greater than or equal to the function value at x star which is the center of this ball so that's the definition of a local minimum i'm only looking at the points around x star within that set convex set capital x and of course it's a global minimum f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x in capital x and you can replace capital x with rn and you recover the definition that we had studied in the in the case of unconstrained optimization any question so now we know what it means for a point to be a local or a global minimum in the context of optimization over convex sets now let's look at a necessary condition for optimality so i'll keep i'll erase these two definitions because i want to write stuff here and i'll keep this diagram right here maybe i'll erase this sphere thing as well so the necessary condition is as follows so x star is a local minimum which implies gradient of fx star transpose x minus x star is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in capital x okay we'll prove it in a bit but let's try to understand pictorially what exactly this means so everyone is familiar with contour plot have you uh, are you guys familiar with contour plot so i have a function f which looks like this so this is my uh, x1 x2 and this is my f of x1 x2 so my my uh, z direction is basically the function itself the function values so the contour plot is basically you look at the at what place the value of the function is constant right 
And so you look at all the points at which the value of the function is constant, and then you project it onto this x1, x2 plane. So this is my this is my x1, x2 plane, and then the contour plot is going to look something like this. And this is my f equals to 1, f equals to 2, f equals to 3, and so on. So this is known as a contour plot. So contour plot was the way people used to navigate in olden days and in Lord of the Rings when they are going up in the mountain. Okay, So they use contour plot to know which way is sloping upwards and which way is sloping downwards. Okay. They used to carry these contour plots in like charts. And so if you are in military, you will actually know how to use contour plots for going around in the mountains. It's very useful. So this is known as a contour plot. So I'm drawing the contour plot in an x1, x2 plane. I'm basically looking at the function from the top. And wherever the function values are the same, I'm going to basically draw a, uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, draw all the points uh, at which the function values are the same. So this is my f1, this is my f equals to, so, so at all these points my function value f is equal to 2, at all these points the function value f is equal to 3 and so on. And now I have a convex set, so let me translate that contour plot here. And in the x1, x2 plane I have a convex set something like this. Where is the minimum point? I think I made some, no, I think it's okay. So this is the point at which the minimum will be achieved. Uh, I think I should maybe move the set a little bit down. So let me do that. This is my convex set capital X. So I'm drawing the contour plot and the convex set. I'm superimposing both of these plots. And this is my f equals to 1, f equals to 2, f equals to 3. Now what are the set of feasible direction? And this is going to be my x star. This is my x star. This point here, right here, this point is my x star. What are the feasible directions from x star? What are the places where you can go from x star while staying in the set capital X? It is all of these directions. Right? So if you take any small step in any of these directions, you're actually within the set capital X itself. Okay, so all feasible directions are X minus X star, where X is in capital set X. So by feasible, what I mean is, if I take a step in that direction, I don't go outside of the set, so I still maintain all the requirements of being within that particular set. So that's this part, x minus x star. So I have all the x minus x star drawn here. Okay, these are my x minus x star. Now what is gradient of f evaluated at x star? What is this gradient? So how do you know in which direction the gradient is pointing? So when you're standing at x star, you have to look at in which direction the function value is increasing. 
Okay, so if you look at it, the function value is increasing, moving outward of this particular, uh, this particular contour. So essentially, the function will be increasing in this particular direction. This is not colorful enough. So this, this direction is my gradient of f at x star. And the reason is the gradient will always be pointing towards the direction where the value of the function is increasing. So I'm going from f equals to one contour to f equals to two contour to f equals to three contour. So that's the, de that's the gradient. And what this statement is saying is that if x star is the optimal point, if it is a local minimum, then the gradient the inner product between the gradient and all the feasible direction has to be non-negative. What does it mean for inner product between two vectors to be non-negative? It means that the two vectors are less than 90 degrees. They are making an angle of less than 90 degrees. Only then the inner product is going to be non-negative. As you can see here, all of these angles, they're all less than 90 degree angle, okay? And that's why the inner product is going to be non-negative. Okay. So let's go over this once again. I'm standing at X star, all the feasible direction so that I don't go outside of the set capital X is given by X minus X star. These are all the feasible directions. Uh, the gradient of the function F is going to be pointing outwards in the direction where the function value is increasing. So that's my gradient of fx star. And what this statement is saying, and which we can visualize in this picture as well, is that all these angles between the feasible direction and this vector gradient of fx star, they are making an angle less than 90 degrees in all directions. No matter which direction you pick, the angle is less than 90 degree, and that's why this inner product is going to be non-negative. Now let's see how do we prove this statement. So any question on this figure? Yes. So, like, already, uh, to know that, uh, the gradient is pointing uh, Because, you know, the function value increases. Uh, <coughs> if you move in the direction of the gradient, the value of the function is supposed to increase. No, it cannot. So let's, let's see why. Uh, f of x plus d equals to f of x, let's do approximation, plus gradient of f of x transpose d, right? So if I pick d to be gradient of fx, you have like the norm of gradient of fx here, which means that fx plus d is going to be greater than f of x, right? So in the direction gradient of f of x, the value of the function is going to increase. If, you, if you're standing at x and you're moving in the direction of d, if the direction d is equal to the gradient of f of x, then the value should increase. So that's why the gradient will always be pointing towards increasing value of the function f. For any function? For any function, in any space. No, not only convex. Not only convex, any function. The only problem is sometimes you are you know, at a saddle point or something, like if it's a general nonlinear function, you can have like different complicated contours, in which case uh, it's a bit complicated to figure out what the direction of the function is, the gradient of the function is going to be. So like at local minimum maximum gradient of the function will be zero, right? Uh, right, exactly. If the gradient is zero, then of course the function value will remain the same. So like here, we are taking x bar is a local minimum. Correct. So gradient at that point will be zero. Yes. So like if you are taking the gradient at that point, then the function value will remain the same. Correct. This is the constraint optimization. So the gradient need not be zero. So the gradient here, so for this function, the gradient is zero at this point. But that point doesn't lie in the set capital X. This is the point where gradient of f is equal to zero. Okay, that's the point at which the minimum is achieved. That's this point. Okay, so the gradient is zero here, but that doesn't lie within the set capital X, so it doesn't matter to us. 
because we are optimizing only in the set. We don't look at what's happening outside the set. Correct. This is inside the set, right? This point x star is inside the set. It's at the boundary of the set. And that's why this set is supposed to be a closed set. It cannot be an open set, because then boundary is not included. So we have a closed set here. OK. Any other question? What is the intuitive meaning of the set not containing the uh, Equal to zero point. Oh, uh, see the 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 way you define the convex set, it doesn't matter where the function is getting minimized, where the minimum point is, because you can define your set in a way that you are far away from this minimum point. Only at the minimum point, the gradient is going to be zero. At all other points, at all of these points, the gradient is non-zero. Right. So. Uh, so, so that's why you will have a non-zero gradient at x star, unless this x star is inside the set itself. Then it may have a zero gradient. But if x star is at the boundary, you will have a non-zero gradient. And all I'm saying is you need to make sure that for all feasible direction, this vector is supposed to make a less than 90 degree angle. And we'll prove it in a, in a short while. But I wanted to give the pictorial intuition beforehand. Uh, because only then, so when, when, is, when is the inner product between two vectors greater than non-negative? So what is A transpose B? It is absolute value of A, absolute value of B, cos theta. Right? So if this is non-negative, this is positive, this is positive, so this must be greater than or equal to zero. And if this has to be greater than or equal to zero, then theta has to be less than 90 degree. Uh, so I, actually, I just uh, still very confused about uh, why they are more than or equal to zero. Uh, greater than or equal to zero. The gradient and the direction are more than or equal to zero. They are in a product. Uh, I mean, this is, the inner, this is the inner product between the vectors. Right, so. so you want to know the mathematical proof or you want to know the pictorial proof? Maybe the mathematical Yeah, so we'll, we are getting to the mathematical proof right after this. Yes. Right, it can happen. So I'm not saying that. So this is non-negative, right? So it can be equal to 0 also. It's completely fine, as long as it's non-negative. That would be if it contains more in the set. Right. It could be, or even if it is at the boundary, uh, there are special cases where that could happen. So yes. So uh, based on the definition, uh, it kind of uh, can we draw a corollary that uh, if the actual minima is outside the convex set, then the uh, then the minima of the convex set will always lie on the boundary, not inside the set, but on the for boundary. convex functions. Yes, that is the case. For non-convex functions, you could have. But for convex set, it should yes. always lie on the boundary. Yes, yeah, it'll always lie on the boundary. Okay. So I know that f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x minus x star less than epsilon. x lies in capital X. So this means that 0 is less than or equal to, uh, let me pick alpha x star, x minus x star minus f of x star. 
So this is the feasible feasible direction. Uh, x minus x star is a feasible direction. This particular uh, this is true for all x in capital X. So if you look at it, this is 1 minus alpha x star plus alpha x. So this must lie in capital X because capital X is convex. OK, everybody understands and agrees with this statement? Yes? No? OK. So I'm taking a step in the direction of x. OK? So what does this mean? That I'm looking at the direction x minus x star, and then I'm taking a small step alpha in that direction, and I'm standing at x star. Let's, let's go back to that uh, figure of the set. Here is my x star. I pick a point x. This is x minus x star. And I'm going to take a small step alpha. This is my this point. OK? So I'm standing at x star. I pick a point x. Uh, and then I take a small, small step alpha in that direction. And I know that this point is going to lie in the set capital X itself because capital X is a convex set. So every point in this line segment will lie in the set itself. So that's what I was stating here. What should I do now? I'm going to divide it by alpha. alpha is greater than 0. What is the next obvious step? Alpha goes to 0. So I get 0 less than equal to limit alpha goes to 0. And f of x star plus alpha x minus x star minus f of x star over alpha. That becomes my necessary condition for optimality. Any question? OK, so this statement should hold for every x in x and for every alpha greater than 0. So I can take the limit alpha going to 0. And I'll retain this uh, inequality here. So 0 is less than, so this side doesn't depend on alpha. So I'm taking limit alpha goes to 0 on both sides, but this side doesn't depend on alpha. So it remains 0. And the right side. You take the limit alpha going to 0, what you get is the first order, first term in the Taylor series. And that's exactly what this particular statement is saying. That if x star is a local minimum, then this inner product is greater than or equal to 0. So we've done the proof by picture and then proof by mathematical manipulations. OK. Now, in the case when f is convex, then this is if and only if condition, just like it was the case in, uh, in the uh, 
what was that the, for the when we were talking about sufficient conditions for optimality for unconstrained case the necessary condition was also sufficient for convex function the same thing happens here if the function f is convex then this goes both sides so if f is convex then x star global minimum if and only if gradient f x star transpose x minus x star is greater than or equal to 0. So that is another statement that we need to keep in mind. And I am going to erase this side of the board. So let's look at uh, the box constraint right here and let's assume we are minimizing a function over a box then let's try to see what happens. Uh, so my constraint is So what does the gradient of fx star satisfy when I am looking at the box constraint? So let's try to do that uh, example. If I pick, so remember that let's say x star is optimal, x star is a local minimum. So there could be three cases. xi star equals to ai, xi star equals to bi, xi star lies in open interval ai and bi. So either it is in the lower end of the boundary, it could be at the upper end of the boundary or it is exactly in between, somewhere in between. So let's construct a x I'm going to construct x by x1 star uh, then ai plus epsilon and then x x n star okay so i want to know what the gradient of fx star looks like if i am trying to minimize a function over a box set and i know that x star is a local minimum so i need to make sure that this condition is satisfied for all x. I don't have to make sure, but this condition I know that will be satisfied for all x. So I'm going to come up with a very specific x where I pick x1 star, x2 star all the way until the ith component. The ith component is now ai plus epsilon. And then all the other components are again back to the optimal coordinate. Okay, so going back to the picture, So this is my x star and I'm just going to go down a little bit by a step epsilon. I'm just taking a small step epsilon in the other direction and I'm looking at case one. What do I get uh, when I do the gradient of fx star transpose x minus x star? So this minus x star 
what is this equal to? 0, 0, 0, epsilon 0, 0, 0. Right? So I pick this to be equal to x. I subtract x star, I get 0, 0, 0, except at the ith position I get an epsilon and for all the other cases I have 0, 0, 0. And this condition needs to be satisfied. So gradient of fx star transpose x minus x star is equal to gradient of fx star ith position times epsilon and this needs to be non-negative. Yes. We are just trying to construct an x and we'll substitute that x here and we will try to see what property the gradient of f at x star satisfies in the case of a box constraint. You will see it very quickly why I'm picking this specific value of x. This one needs to be satisfied for all x. So in particular, I can pick any value of x and this condition still needs to be satisfied. So I'm constructing a specific x so that I get some cool result here. So this has nothing to do with the cases? Uh, which cases? So what are the cases? Uh, so this x star, so when I look at this x star, the optimal value, the, the optimal point, local minimum, I could have only these three cases, right? Either xi star is equal to ai, or xi star is equal to bi, or xi star could be in between ai and bi. Okay? So if it is at ai, and I take a small step epsilon in the direction, like within the set, so remember ai is the lower bound. So if I, if I pick my x to be ai plus epsilon, it will still lie within this particular bound. So it will still lie within the set capital X itself. So I'm taking this small step in the direction of, uh, in the ith direction, I'm moving away from ai towards bi, taking a small step uh, epsilon. And what I see is epsilon is a positive number. So this implies gradient of fx star, the ith component is non-negative. So if I have a point x star, and I know that the ith position of x star is equal to the lower bound of this set, then the gradient of the function has to be non-negative in that particular coordinate. And you can go through the same argument and you can prove should be less than equal to zero and in this case, should be equal to zero. Okay, so what we are doing is, if you have a box constraint, if you have a function f, and you know that x star is a local minima, then at that local minima, if xi star is equal to ai, then this derivative, the ith component of the derivative has to be non-negative. If xi star equals to bi, then the, the ith component of the derivative has to be less than equal to zero. And if xi star lies within the set itself, ai and bi, open set ai, bi, then this derivative is supposed to be equal to zero. So that's what we are trying to see, how you can use this uh, necessary condition for optimality to understand what property the gradient of f is going to satisfy at x star. And that's why we were going through this construction. So in the case of bi, uh, this will become bi minus epsilon, and in this case, you will have both ai plus epsilon and bi minus epsilon, and you will see that, uh, sorry, xi star plus epsilon and xi star minus epsilon. And you will see that this, you will have, uh, 
this greater than equal to zero and negative of this greater than equal to zero, which means that the gradient itself is vanish is uh, is zero at the ith coordinate. Yes. So um, if I draw an analogy with this example with an unconstrained optimization example, we can assume that AI is minus infinity and BI is plus infinity. So Not quite. Not quite? No. Because, uh, for See, because what happens when you are picking infinity is if you subtract epsilon from it or add epsilon to it, it still remains infinity. So it doesn't really give you much insight in those but, but, cases. But the case three is only applicable for the unconstrained optimization case one and case two appears due to the constraint. due to the constraint the con correct right? correct correct exactly yes, I, was I was trying to interpolate because in the assignment you mentioned something that the necessary conditions and the su sufficient conditions do not hold at plus minus infinity correct the range, correct right? correct so in this way does the analogy kind of make sense yes yes so you can't really uh, so when you are using plus or plus infinity or minus infinity, you have to be careful because somewhere in the proof you might be assuming that these values are finite. So in this case, we are explicitly using the fact that this AI and BI is finite. If they happen to be infinity, then this proof will not hold at all. So let's pretend this can be uh, converged. Uh, this can converge to the unconstrained unconstrained problem for arbitrarily very large, very large negative number of AI and very large positive number of BI but not infinity, right? Correct. Then it's then it holds. As long as it's finite, it holds. Then you don't have to worry about it. Any other question? Yes. Is AI and BI like still, um, you know, in that set? Would it, or would it just be any bounds we pay? Would it still be? Uh, so AI and BI should lie within the set itself. Yeah, it yeah, because they are at the boundary, right? This is the boundary. So going back to the figure, so this point is A1, A2, A3. This will be B1, A2, A3. This will be A1, B b1 no b2 a3 and so on and so forth so these are all the coordinates and these points lie within the set itself so the vertices are part of the set uh, that's why you have this uh, equality sign here any other question If it is at the boundary, then the gradient will be either positive or negative, depending on which side of the boundary it is. Uh, but if it is inside the set, if it is somewhere here, in the center of this uh, cube, then all the gradients will vanish. Yeah, which, is, which will get you to that unconstrained case, because you can move in any direction and your gradient will still have to be zero. Any other question? L1 loss. So sphere, when we were talking about sphere, that was the L1 sphere. You can have those constraints also. Usually in compressed sensing, you pick those kind of sets where you're looking at the L1 ball and you want to restrict the size of the L1 ball. Any other question? Okay. Let's look at a uh, convex case. So this is known as a projection. Okay, so let's say I want to project minus C, a vector minus C onto this particular set. So what is happening? I have this set. Maybe I'll draw it on that side. Uh, 
I have this set ax equals to 0. This is my origin. There is a vector negative c. And I want to project this vector onto this particular set. So I want to find the point on this set that is closest to negative c. OK, this process is known as projection. So I have a vector minus c, negative c. And I want to project this particular vector onto this set. So what does it mean to project it? What I want to find is the point x star that is closest to this point, negative c. OK, and this x star has to lie within this set. So this is known as projecting minus c onto a subspace. Now, it turns out what we are trying to minimize is the distance between x star and negative c. So this can be formulated as an optimization problem. Oh, I should say x, not x star here. So I want to find the point x that is having a minimum distance with negative c, and it lies on this subspace, which is ax equal to 0. So instead of going through the derivation of how to solve this problem, let's say, sorry, half of x plus c square. So this is x. This vector is x plus c. So x minus minus c. So let me write it as this. So which is x plus c. I'm trying to minimize the total distance, the L2 norm, such that ax equals to 0. Is this function f convex? Is this function f convex? It is convex. Okay, second derivative is identity matrix, so this function f is convex. And this is a convex set, ax equals to 0. So I have, uh, I'm minimizing a convex function over a convex set. Let's say somebody gave me this point x star, which is given by negative i minus. OK, somebody gave me this x star. I want to know whether this x star is the optimal point or not. Is it a global minimum in this particular case or not? What am I supposed to check? I'm supposed to check for this condition. For all x in capital X, is gradient of fx star transpose x minus x star non-negative or not? OK, so that's what I need to check. I have uh, 20 seconds to check that. <laughs> so let's check it in the next class, OK? Uh, we'll, we'll revisit this particular problem in the next class. The thing to keep in mind uh, for the next class is I want to show that no matter which direction I go from this point, I want to make sure that this particular inequality is satisfied in all directions. So we'll try to verify that in the next class and prove that this is indeed the optimal point. It is indeed the global minimum. Uh, when you are solving problem of this type, just by checking the necessary and sufficient condition for optimality. So that's it. Uh, I'll see you guys on Friday. Thank you. <laughs>